Welcome everyone to this week's Grand Rounds. It's the final Grand Rounds before uh, before Christmas and uh, I'm very very pleased to welcome my friend and colleague uh, Professor James Chalmers who was due to speak earlier in this in the uh, in the program um, but was uh, unable to do so at that time but I'm, and he's very kindly agreed to take this slot at the end of the semester to come and talk about his research. James Chalmers and I were registrars together many moons ago in this very parish and uh, he has gone on to great and fabulous things. He's now the British Lung Foundation Chair of Respiratory Research. Uh, he's based here in Dundee and uh, leads uh, a, an incredibly successful research unit um, just along the corridor from me. Um, I think it's only fair to say that he is one of, if not the uh, leading opinion in bronchiectasis in Europe, perhaps even the world. Um, and it's a real privilege to have a, a true world expert speak at Grand Rounds about something and even more proud that he's, uh, that he's from Dundee and one of my friends. So James is gonna talk about this, uh, um, the net benefit finding a new treatment for inflammatory diseases with I think a particular reference to bronchiectasis, our shared interest. James, thanks very much for coming along. Looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much, Tom. And, and Tom's too polite or modest to say so, but um, an awful lot of the, the work that we're, we've done and a lot of the work that I'm going to present is only possible because of collaborations with people like himself, um, obtaining patient samples and, and helping us to run the clinical service that we do in, in Tayside. So uh, right back at you, Tom. Uh, it's my pleasure to talk to you about um, Really, I think I'm gonna give you a whiz through about 10 years of work in 40 minutes um, to talk to you about developing treatments for inflammatory diseases and particularly talking about neutrophilic diseases, which are diseases that historically we haven't had treatments for uh, and has been the focus of the work in, in our laboratory over the last 10 years or so. Uh, and it obviously culminates, the reason why we're, we're talking today is the recent publication of a study of a new drug that targets neutrophilic disease. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, I was just talking with Tom before we came on air that I was hoping he would do something like a Christmas quiz or a few Christmas jokes because I, I don't have uh, many in here. But all, all I want for Christmas is to tell you about neutrophils, which are my favorite cell in the body. I'm going to tell you about a new drug uh, and I'm going to tell you about how that might uh, influence how we treat COVID-19 in the future because of a clinical trial that's running in, in Tayside at the moment that many of you will be aware of. So that's, that's what I'm gonna talk about in this presentation. And it's probably important I introduce you to neutrophils because everything I'm gonna tell you about in the next 40 minutes or so comes from this, which is an understanding of this cell that is a key part of your immune system. So neutrophils are circulating blood cells generated in your bone marrow, and they're a key part of your response to bacterial and fungal pathogens in particular. Anyone who's been on call and got the phone call, oh dear, it's a patient with neutropenic sepsis, knows what happens when you don't have neutrophils, you're much more susceptible to infections with bacteria, fungi, other opportunistic pathogens. And so they're an absolutely vital part of the immune system. They're rapidly recruited to sites of infection, and that's really important in, in normal people. If I bronchoscope Thomas just now, um, I wouldn't find many neutrophils or any at all in his lungs because hopefully he doesn't have a lung infection at the moment. And so they're a responsive part of the immune system. They only go where they're needed when they're needed. And that's why they're implicated in multiple inflammatory diseases because they, when they get somewhere that they're not meant to be, uh, they do damage because they are in some ways, if you want to use a military analogy, they're kind of the infantry of the immune system. They go in when there's a problem and they start a fight, which means that they can, they can cause significant collateral damage. They're recognizable, as you can see from this image on the, the left-hand side, by this multi-lobe nucleus, sometimes therefore called polymorphonuclear granulocytes, meaning uh, multiple shaped uh, nucleus. And these little granules are their weapons in the fight against bacteria and fungi. They're what they use to fire at those uh, uh, bacteria or fungi or fuse when they take those cells inside the cell during a process called phagocytosis. They will kill uh, using toxic contents of those granules, but they can also cause disease, as you'll see. And I'm a respiratory physician, so I'm really focused on neutrophilic lung diseases, um, as are many of my colleagues. Uh, and so the disease I particularly use as a model of neutrophilic disease is bronchiectasis, but neutrophils are also 
very important in COPD. They're very important in a subset of patients with severe asthma. They're the dominant cell in cystic fibrosis. They're the cell that causes the majority of lung damage in patients with pneumonia. And as I'll show you, they're very important in COVID-19. But if you're not a respiratory physician, and many people on the call will not be, uh, your diseases may also be neutrophil driven. So inflammatory bowel disease is a classical neutrophil driven disease. When we look at the proteome, meaning all the proteins implicated in disease, in inflammatory bowel disease, they're indistinguishable from bronchiectasis. They look like the same disease at the cellular level. Neutrophils are very important in cancer, particularly in metastases of cancer. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis is very much a, a neutrophil driven disease. Many causes of chronic renal failure, including things like lupus nephritis, very uh, neutrophil dominant. Uh, and ischemic heart disease, um, um, atherosclerotic plaques are full of neutrophils um, and neutrophils uh, and neutrophil functions are implicated in rupture of plaques uh, during, during myocardial infarction. So what I, I guess what I'm saying is there's something in here for everyone, uh, although I'm going to be focusing on respiratory disease because that's my interest. And we all work with neutrophils every day. We all see patients that have uh, neutrophilic type inflammation. If you're wondering what neutrophils look like at a macro level, pus is essentially a collection of neutrophils. This is an abscess on somebody's neck. You can see the pus coming out. Uh, these, the, the fluid appears green. Uh, and I often use this for teaching to ask students, why does pus appear green? And it's because of a, a protein. The only green protein in your body is a protein called myeloperoxidase, which sits in the granules of those neutrophil cells. So you see something that's bright green like cystic fibrosis sputum, and it's because you're seeing release of those green proteins from, uh, from neutrophils. So we see neutrophils every day, even if we don't recognize as clinicians that we're looking at neutrophils. And this is what neutrophils do. So this is a beautiful image created by uh, my fantastic PhD student, uh, Ashley. Neutrophils are, are generated in the bone marrow. They flow in the circulation. Uh, when they get a signal to say that there's a problem in a tissue, they get a signal inside the blood vessel to say clamp on to the blood vessel um, through these receptors that you can see labeled here. They pass through gaps that appear in the blood vessel wall to allow them to pass into the tissue. And then they follow a signal. In this case, there's some cartoon bacteria here, a signal from the bacteria to say, come over here and, 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 and eat me. And so they follow, and that's a process called chemotaxis. Once they encounter a bacteria, they can take it inside the cell in a process called phagocytosis. And that's a, a very clean way of getting rid of bacteria by taking them up. Uh, but it, there's many reasons why bacteria are able to evade phagocytosis um, and uh, or uh, are not phagocytosable. And in situations where that's not possible or in response to certain inflammatory stimuli, they'll go through this process that we're going to talk about a lot today called netosis, where they essentially explode and release their uh, contents out into the environment. You can imagine that if that happens, it can be more damaging to the to the body than doing the nice clean process of phagocytosis. Uh, a nice Christmas analogy is the way my wife opens Christmas presents is very neat, very tidy and results in uh, no collateral damage. Whereas myself or my children opening Christmas presents, ripping them open dramatically and throwing everything everywhere results in significant collateral damage. So if you're wondering about this process of phagocytosis, um, Bacteria that are sat in the, in the alveolus, there's a cartoon of an alveolus, neutrophils move towards it, take it up inside the cell. And there's a beautiful video here of what that looks like. So this is a neutrophil inside, uh, sorry, clamped on the end of a pipette tip. And this is a molecule called zymazan, which is something it wants to eat. And you can see it moving towards the target, trying to eat it. It's getting teased, come on, I wanna eat this. And you can see it follows the signal that this is sending. Uh, in order to constantly change direction. And you'll see it eat it in a moment, which means it envelopes it inside its cell membrane, takes it inside the cell. Beautiful. Uh, that's how you would deal with, for example, inhaling air pollution particles, or if you inhaled a few bacterial cells today, that's how your lungs would get rid of these kinds of things. When you have chronic diseases and your neutrophils become dysfunctional, 
they undergo this process that I've described called net release, which is where uh, instead of taking up bacteria into the cell, they, the body tries to trap it by releasing these webs of DNA. DNA is incredibly sticky. So the DNA from inside the cells try to trap the uh, bacteria, stop them from spreading. So most abscesses are filled with nets because you're unable to clear the infection, but you try and stop it from spreading, which is how we understand uh, what we're talking about when we talk about an abscess. So you can imagine that that's an incredibly powerful uh, and incredibly damaging process. And there's a video here that illustrates that. So these are, these are neutrophils and the red dye here is DNA, which is the stuff that they're using to trap. And you can watch as time goes by in response to a stimulus here, the cells are initially perfectly happy. They start to produce more of these webs and you start to see the DNA coming out and you see this explosive process where the entire field is eventually full of this sticky DNA that's, that's coated in antimicrobial proteins that are highly inflammatory. Imagine that happening in your lung and you can see why airways would become blocked, alveoli would become less effective at, at moving oxygen and patients may start to feel symptoms. And that's the process uh, that many of us in the lab study and that we think is really important to disease. This is another cartoon illustrating that process. You can see the cell here. You can see the bacteria trapped by these webs. Uh, and that's an illustration of, of what that's meant to do. But of course, as I've mentioned, it causes significant collateral damage. It's important in chronic diseases like COPD, bronchiectasis, cystic fibrosis, but we also increasingly recognize it's a critical process in acute lung injury. This is the x-ray of a patient with severe COVID-19, uh, and you can see the characteristic peripheral shadowing that we see in these patients with loss of uh, both diaphragms because of uh, the lungs filling up with proteinaceous fluid. Why does that happen? It's a process called, uh, called pulmonary edema, but it's not the pulmonary edema that we see with heart failure. It's not an increase in the amount of fluid going into the lungs because of increased uh, pressure. It's actually damage to the membrane that protects the lung caused by these cells that I'm talking about called neutrophils. So as they're passing through tissues, they release enzymes that cut holes in the airway in order to allow them to, to enter. So they cause damage to the epithelium and the, the hyaline membrane. And inside the airway, they do that, but they also block the pumps that are intended to clear fluid from the airways. So they both increase the permeability, meaning more fluid comes in and they stop fluid coming out. And that's why in a patient with COVID-19, you'll see an increase in fluid in the lungs uh, and tells us that these cells are also very important in diseases like COVID. But I promised you I would tell you a bit about bronchiectasis. Bronchiectasis is the disease that I study predominantly uh, and is a, a classical neutrophilic disease. It's, it's associated with production of sputum uh, that's often green because of the presence of lots of neutrophils in the airway. It's been described as the most neglected disease in respiratory medicine. Uh, and so we're very proud that uh, Dundee in particular has taken a, a leading role nationally and internationally in trying to write that and trying to increase the attention that's paid to this condition. Patients are characteristically 60-year-old females with uh, increased cough, sputum production, and recurrent respiratory infections. But this affects people from, uh, from young children all the way up to patients in later life. Uh, there are multiple causes, including many systemic diseases. So any of you who are working in rheumatology and gastroenterology, uh, in medicine for the elderly, in any specialty, may see patients with bronchiectasis. Uh, the pathophysiology is that the normal uh, movement of air through your lungs goes through the trachea and into these nice tight bronchi, which transmit the air through to the alveolus. In bronchiectasis, damage to the walls leads to dilation, uh, filling with fluid, filling with mucus, and you get um, uh, damage, respiratory failure, and chronic symptoms. The biggest effect of, uh, of losing that definition to your airway wall is that you lose the ability to easily clear mucus from the airway. So you have this nice uh, mucociliary escalator that's meant to shift mucus 
from the bottom of the lungs to the mouth so that it can be expectorated or swallowed. You can see here in a video, uh, nasal cilia slowed down so that you can see them beating in a coordinated fashion to push mucus towards their target, which is the upper part of the respiratory tract. And you can see a picture of here beads on top of a cilia uh, culture moving downwards in a directional movement to get rid of the to get rid of the mucus or in this case the beads. So that process is absolutely critical to making maintaining lung health and that fails in people with bronchiexis because of the dilation and because of the effects of chronic inflammation and that's what leads to, to symptoms and that's what leads to characteristic CT appearances like this where the normal tight airways which shouldn't really be visible in the central part of this CT scan, this is the right lung and the left lung, you can see huge airways here filled with these solid matter, which is mucus that can't be shifted because that mucociliary system has failed. Uh, and that eventually becomes infected, leading to recruitment of neutrophils and you get the, the characteristic green sputum. So that's the disease, Cr chronic, uh, disabling, horrible disease caused by neutrophilic inflammation. And unfortunately, there's very little that we can do about this uh, from a disease modifying point of view. We can help patients a lot by teaching them how to clear their chest through physiotherapy, and we treat the infections through antibiotics. But when we put together guidelines for this disease in 2017, we weren't able to recommend any treatments with high quality evidence and nothing really beyond antibiotics because the main anti-inflammatory drugs that we use in respiratory medicine are inhaled corticosteroids, and they don't work against bronchiexis type inflammation. If anything, inhaled steroids prolong the survival, the lifespan of neutrophils. Uh, they don't work against the majority of neutrophilic diseases uh, and so are not recommended for bronchiectasis. So the message really is we need more drugs and we need treatments that can actually target this specific type of pathophysiology. So how do we start to find a new therapy? How do we pick what we're going to target? Well, the first thing that we have to do is to actually understand the disease. Uh, and so we've just recently published in the Lancet Respiratory Medicine, uh, a study where we looked at the underlying pathophysiology of bronchiectasis using sputum that patients were coughing up. Uh, and this is work from uh, Holly Keir, another outstanding PhD student in the lab. So this uses a technique called proteomics, which measures all of the proteins in a sample. And in this case, the samples are sputum samples from people who are very sick with bronchiexis and people who are relatively well. Uh, and looking at what's the difference in people that are very sick can tell us what's likely to be driving that sickness. And what we found was uh, most of the severe patients in the red cluster together, meaning uh, there's a similar pathophysiology in most of the severe patients. And the proteins associated with that are all here. Uh, and I won't go through each of the proteins, but they all are part of this process called neutrophil extracellular trap formation that I've mentioned before. So we have a strong clue from this study that that process is really important in driving disease pathology. And we've spent a number of years in the lab developing different ways of measuring that. We've got assays that can measure the trap process itself, or some of the enzymes that are released through the traps. And I'll show you a video of one here, uh, which is work from uh, another uh, PI in the division, which is Amelia Schumark, who studied a point of care test, which is like a pregnancy test, where you add sputum onto the strip and it goes red with a band if you have the enzyme present, meaning that you've got active neutrophilic inflammation in the airway. So that's really cool. We can say who's going to get sick, based on the presence of inflammation in the lungs in a really simple test. And using tests like that, we're able to divide patients into those that have lots of this type of inflammation uh, and those that don't. And when you look at that data uh, and then follow patients up, for, uh, up in time, here we've divided patients into three groups. Low levels of inflammation are the orange and the green, high levels of inflammation are the blue, and it's very easy to spot that the patients who are in the blue in the high levels of inflammation group are having more hospital admissions because of severe chest infections and have an increased mortality. Uh, and so that's really important. That tells us that we're on the right track. This process, this type of inflammation is involved in driving the disease severity that we see in patients. 
But showing that we can measure poor outcome is not enough. We need to be able to modify it. And so we need to try and develop therapies that can uh, change this pathophysiology. And so we need to understand what actually causes the process of net formation, which we think is so central to bronchiectasis and other diseases. Uh, and this is an illustration of the, the mechanisms that underlie this. Bacterial in infection or exposure to damage associated molecular patterns or other types of stimuli initiate a process within the cells that unravel their normal structure so they can spit out those webs of DNA like Spider-Man. And one of the critical points in this pathway is the enzyme that I've already mentioned called neutrophil elastase, which is a cutting enzyme. It chops things up and it chops up the bonds inside the nucleus of this cell to allow it to dispel that or, or send out that DNA. And so if you were able to block that enzyme inside the cell, you would be able to prevent this whole process from happening. And neutrophils that are minded to go down the pathway on the bottom wouldn't be able to do that anymore and they'd be forced to go back to the healthier, cleaner method of getting rid of bacteria. That's the dream, that's the idea, um, but we needed to find a way to do that. And one way to do that is to target the cells inside the bone marrow. So your neutrophils develop in your bone marrow and then get released into the bloodstream. And at the point that they're being generated, they don't contain active enzymes. They don't contain active neutrophil elastase. So at the point at which a neutrophil is born, it's not able to make neutrophil extracellular traps. It needs to be activated through the action of this enzyme called DPP1, uh, which is dipeptidylpeptidase 1, which cuts off part of the enzyme to make it active. And then it's packaged into granules. So if we could somehow block that, uh, neutrophils may be born that don't contain these enzymes and can't misbehave in the context of chronic inflammatory disease. And the, there's a correlate of this, which is that there's a very rare disease called Papillon-Lefebvre syndrome, which was described by two French physicians in 1924, no prizes for guessing the names of the two French physicians, which is incredibly rare. It's, the prevalence is estimated about one in one million. So, you know, we always say things are one in a million. This really is one in a million. Uh, there's very few people with this condition in Scotland. It's autosomal recessive genetic disease, and it's caused by absence of that enzyme, DPP1. But the amazing thing about this condition is that they, patients have these neutrophil cells. They can't make nets, but they can kill bacteria, as you can see on the right-hand side here, completely normally the same as anyone else, which is the perfect profile for a drug to target this. We want, we want a drug that can block netosis, uh, reduce inflammation, but that doesn't make you more susceptible to infection. And this genetic disease suggests that that might be possible by targeting this enzyme. And this is the data showing that, um, that they can't make nets. So on the left-hand side, you can see the controls with a stimulus. They've got all of these structures that look like nets. On the right-hand side, in the Papillon-Lefebvre syndrome patients, nothing at all to see. You can clearly see the difference there. But there's always a catch, and there's a catch with Papillon-Lefebvre syndrome, which is that uh, people that have that condition don't get infections, but they do get strange thickening of the skin in their hands uh, and in the soles of their feet and all other uh, surfaces that, that uh, get injuries. And during childhood, they get periodontitis, they get um, inflammation of the gums. The reasons why this happens is not clear. It probably means that those enzymes are involved in, because they're chopping enzymes, they're involved in chopping off excess skin from the, from the body. So there's a catch. We've got a drug that looks like it would really work if we were able to target that enzyme, but there are potential side effects. Um, and so uh, in collaboration with the uh, pharmaceutical company Insmed, uh, Insmed have developed a DPP-1 inhibitor uh, that blocks competitively this enzyme DPP1 and therefore allows uh, neutrophils to be generated in the bone marrow that come out into the systemic circulation without these active enzymes and therefore are less likely to cause inflammatory damage. That's the theory. How does that work? This is the development process of these cells. They start off 
as myeloblasts. Think of them as, as baby neutrophils or cells with the potential to turn into neutrophils. At that point, the drug blocks the act action of DPP-1. They undergo completely normal maturation, which is important to emphasize takes a couple of weeks. And then they're released into the circulation, but without the ability to cause that inflammatory damage, we hope. So in a, in a phase one study in healthy volunteers that was tested, and this is measuring the amount of neutrophil elastase, which is that inflammatory marker in healthy volunteers after being given the drug. And this is the result. You can see that over the first few days, everything's fine until those new neutrophils are released into the circulation. And then you get this marked drop in inflammation in the blood down to about 75%. And this is probably the sweet spot because we don't want to achieve 100% inhibition of this enzyme because we'd be giving people papillon Lefebvre syndrome. We'd be potentially risking side effects. Uh, but at this level, very few side effects, but the inhibition of DPP-1. Uh, and in the control, you can see, although there's a lot of noise with any inflammatory measurement, not much is happening. So we've got a drug that blocks this pathway that we think is critical to bronchiectasis and other inflammatory diseases. So we need to test it. Uh, so we need to test it. And so we designed a study, which is called the Willow study, which is a phase two trial of two doses of this drug that's called Brenzocatib against placebo over a six month period in people with bronchiectasis. So after a six week screening period, patients were randomized to either two different doses of the drug or placebo followed up for six months. And the primary outcome was the occurrence of a chest infection, which we call pulmonary exacerbation. So these are dramatic worsenings in patient symptoms that lead to significant morbidity uh, and in some cases mortality. They're what we want to prevent in this disease and they're neutrophil driven. So it makes sense as the, the primary outcome. We also measured symptoms, lung function, and also whether we were able to reduce inflammation in the airway. Uh, and this was recently published in the New England Journal of Medicine. It's online at the moment, so you can access this uh, to see the full data whenever you want. So we screened 416 patients to randomize 256. Uh, you can see the distribution between placebo and the two drug dose groups there. And uh, over 20, over 80% um, of patients completed the study with more dropouts in the placebo group, as you might expect. Uh, it was blinded, I should emphasize. And this is the primary outcome result. We were hoping to see that patients would have fewer exacerbations. And this is the Kaplan-Meier curve that confirms that that's the case. So in both the blue and the green are the two doses of the medication. And you can see that they have a, a prolonged time to the first event compared to the patients who received placebo. The hazard ratio, which is an estimate of how effective the medicine was, is 0 0.58 and 0 0.62, um, so roughly a 40% reduction. To give you an example, our current standard of care for patients with severe bronchiectasis is inhaled antibiotics, and that achieves about a 20% reduction in this endpoint. So we have uh, a drug here that looks remarkably effective compared to others that have come before. When we look at the proportion of patients that had events during the study, about half of patients over a six month period had one of these events compared to about a third in both groups receiving the two doses of, of Brenzocatib. Uh, it's interesting that there wasn't an apparent difference between the two doses, uh, uh, despite, as you'll see in a moment, some differences in the effect on inflammation. So neutrophil elastase is the main target of this drug. Um, it's the thing we were aiming to block. And this is the effect on that measured in sputum. Uh, this is at the top, uh, the placebo group, hardly any change in the neutrophil last day's level, dramatic drops in the 10 milligram and even greater drops in the 25 milligram. I would emphasize the left-hand side, this is a log scale. So these differences are really quite marked. The other two enzymes that are inhibited by DPP-1 are cathepsin G and protonase 3, uh, other cutting enzymes, proteases, and we see very similar patterns with these. We didn't present this data in the paper. Uh, so here's a special exclusive for Grand Rounds. Uh, <laughs> uh, and it's, you can see the pattern is almost identical. Within a few weeks, it drops dramatically. After four weeks, it's dropped to um, a fraction of what it was at baseline. 
And after the drug stop, the inflammation comes back, uh, which is expected. But this is a really important piece of data. Uh, Tom's an expert in asthma. He'll tell you that the goal in asthma is to suppress inflammation. We use markers like pheno, eosinophils to measure how much inflammation there is in the body. Uh, and you keep on titrating the anti-inflammatory drug until the patient's not got inflammation anymore. In this, in this trial, we measured at each time point whether we'd managed to suppress inflammation. So this is the data for people who got the drug, depending on whether we managed to suppress their inflammation at the top or whether we didn't manage to suppress their inflammation to below the limit of quantification. And what you see is that uh, patients who continued to have inflammation during the study had lots of exacerbations. Patients where we managed to suppress the inflammation uh, hardly had any exacerbations at all. Whether the, the bottom is due to uh, them needing a higher dose of the drug or whether it's because they didn't comply with the therapy, we're looking into that in greater detail. But the effect here is marked. If you can suppress inflammation in this disease, you can virtually eradicate exacerbations, appears to be the message. Really exciting. And when you look at which patients responded, uh, this is now looking at subgroups by age, by how many, how sick they were at baseline, by whether they were using other drugs, by whether they were infected with particular pathogens. I hope you would agree with me, it looks like the drug works in virtually everybody. There's some of these that overlap simply because the sample sizes are smaller in subgroups, but the message appears to be that this drug is really working across the whole spectrum of disease. And that I think goes back to that data I showed you from the proteomic study, that severe patients, sick patients, almost all had nets. So we found the, the mechanism that appears to be common between the majority, at least, of the severe patients in bronchiectasis. So that's efficacy, and efficacy is really important, but we also need to know that this drug is safe. Uh, and we obviously had that uh, initial thought about papillon Lefebvre syndrome. We don't want to see side effects that are associated with that condition. So here's the, the data on safety. And you do see an increase in treatment emergent adverse effects with the, the drug compared to placebo. This is after excluding exacerbations as an adverse effect. Uh, you certainly see more events. The most common adverse events, though, are very mild. So an increase in cough, which is a very common symptom in bronchiectasis, increase in headache, some sputum changes, uh, which some patients will interpret increased sputum as a positive thing because they're clearing their chest. Uh, but the overall uh, message is no major serious increase in adverse events, because when you look at the serious treatment emergent adverse events, they're actually lower in the treatment groups. So patients are doing better on the drug. But because of this rare genetic condition that causes skin and dental effects, we were particularly interested in whether we'd see skin problems. Here's the skin data. The number of patients having events is relatively low. There is an increase numerically in skin events. There is an increase numerically in dental events. Patients were being seen by a dentist regularly throughout the study because of our anxieties about, uh, about this papillon Lefebvre syndrome. So the dental events are reports from the dentist, meaning they've seen something rather than uh, patients reporting that they're having dental problems. Because when we look at patients that had a change in periodontal pocket depth, meaning they had a serious change in their uh, in their teeth, it's not different between the different groups. So clinically meaningful changes in the dental endpoint were not different between the groups. So the summary of that story is um, really bench to bedside. We've identified a mechanism that's very important in the pathophysiology of this disease and potentially other diseases. Uh, this drug has been developed, which targets that mechanism. We've shown that reduces exacerbations leads to marked reductions in lung inflammation. Uh, that's a phase two study, so I can't prescribe that drug tomorrow, but we've now initiated a phase three trial, uh, which recruited its first patient last week, uh, and hopefully will give us the definitive answer that would allow this to be a, a therapy in clinical practice. But I promised you I wasn't only going to talk about bronchiectasis, um, and I'm going to now move, switch gears to talking about COVID-19, remembering our patient uh, before who's got severe COVID-19, 
acute lung injury, peripheral shadowing, respiratory failure. When we do CTs on these patients, we see that uh, pulmonary edema, that dense inflammatory response. Uh, because uh, if you think about COVID-19, the best way to think about it is a, is a biphasic illness. Anyone who's seen enough of these patients will know that most patients report starting off with an initial viral illness, often with cough, uh, fever, but patients are often not very unwell when their initial symptoms start. During that initial, what we call here the viral phase, there isn't inflammation in the lungs uh, and the symptoms are relatively mild. Most of the patients we see admitted to the COVID unit have had symptoms for seven to 10 days because there seems to be a process that kicks in around that time, which we've coined the, the host inflammatory response phase, where the body's immune system goes into overdrive. You get inflammation in the liver, you get inflammation in the lungs, you get reductions in many blood counts like the lymphocyte count, and you get activation of coagulation pathways. And that leads to this process of acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is what you can see on that, on that X-ray, which is the filling of the lungs with fluid, non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. And here's a CT scan that illustrates it, classic sort of COVID CT scan. Uh, this is the right lung, this is the left lung, and you can see this dense proteinaceous fluid James, we can't hear you. You're James. James. James, can you hear us? James, um, it seems that all I can hear is buzzing. I think other people on the call can just hear buzzing as well, and I don't think James can hear us because he's still talking. So I'll try and contact him through other means, and we'll see if we can come to uh, if we can sort this out. James, can you hear us now? You're having trouble hearing me, Tom. Yeah, we for the last the last two minutes or so, I'm afraid we've just had a strange buzzing. Okay, could you go back a slide or so? Because we, we, we've we've all missed it. Oh, have you got me back now? Yeah, we can get you. We can hear you again now. Um, we just at some point this all we could hear was buzzing. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, I don't. I, think I don't know what that was. I think. Can you just nudge back, maybe, if you go back another slide, back to when you were talking about? Yes. Yeah, so if you just, we got to this point, and then you, then you disappeared. So perhaps you could just describe the CT, oh. and then. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. I'm so sorry. No, that's fine. I'm. I'm sorry that I've been talking for five minutes. That, that was obviously the best five minutes of presenting of my life that's yes, now uh, not been captured. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you could that'd be great. No, so um, I don't know where I, I left you, but the uh, this is the characteristic features of a COVID-19 CT are the lungs filled with this proteinaceous fluid, which is non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, and this ground glass that you can see here, which is inflammatory infiltrate. So that cells in infiltrating the lungs causing damage. Uh, and that model that we looked at earlier of non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema is appropriate for COVID-19 as well, because not surprisingly, I'm gonna tell you that neutrophils are really important to, to COVID as well. They damage the airway lining, allowing fluid to come in. They block reabsorption of fluid through sodium channels uh, and they block the resolution of inflammation. And so if there was a way that we could block that inflammatory process in COVID, 
we could potentially decrease inflammation, allow inflammation to resolve by allowing macrophages to clear neutrophils. We could allow fluid to get out of the airway by letting these channels function. Uh, and obviously, having shown you that we now have a drug that can target neutrophilic inflammation, um, it, it would make sense to try and block these damaging enzymes. Because if you look in the airways of patients with COVID, and there are now autopsy studies that have done that in severe COVID, you see lots of neutrophil extracellular traps. And not, not just that, if you take serum samples, as they did in this beautiful study, and add uh, serum from patients with COVID to healthy neutrophils, they form these neutrophil extracellular traps. So there are factors in COVID that are driving the switch to this damaging neutrophil response. And I've shown you today that we have a way of blocking that, we have a way of reversing that. And so right at the beginning of the, of the pandemic, back in March, uh, we went to the UK government, um, to the urgent public health research panel, and said, we'd like to do a trial of this anti-neutrophil approach in COVID-19. Uh, so to let you know what that is, so the, the COVID-19 response has been remarkable in the UK. Hundreds of new trials have set up over the course of the last six to nine months. Uh, and in order to ensure that many of those trials were able to, to finish and ensure there was enough resource to support those trials, the UK government through the National Institute for Health Research prioritized some of those studies as being, these are the ones that are most important that we think should receive uh, public support and support from the networks. Uh, and one of the most famous in hospitalized patients I'm sure you're all familiar with this now is recovery. That's run from the University of Oxford. It's now produced results for four different drugs. Uh, and it's the maze, main, what we would call phase three platform, which is testing drugs that are already in the clinic, like azithromycin, hydroxychloroquine, dexamethasone. And that's been a key part of the UK response. But underneath that, a number of studies were prioritized to test new drugs that haven't yet been established in clinical practice. And some of those were through platforms. One of them is called Accord, which is uh, run from the University of Southampton. And it was fantastic for Dundee uh, that Stop COVID, which is a trial of this DPP-1 inhibitor, Brenzocatib, was one of the few studies that were nationally prioritized at the beginning of the pandemic. So it's been run by Tayside Clinical Trials Unit by the fantastic team there, delivered through the Clinical Research Center um, and as some of you will have seen from the announcement that went out to the university today, finished recruitment this week. Um, so it's phenomenal timing that we're presenting this now. And the design of that study is very different to the bronchiexis study, of course, because this is an acute condition. Patients are being screened over a period of 24 hours. They're randomized one-to-one -to, -one to either brenzocative or placebo, and then followed up for a month. Uh, and the primary outcome is whether we can reduce poor outcomes in COVID, so using a scale of seven points. So that's, can we reduce mortality, need for uh, ongoing hospitalization, need for mechanical ventilation? And we're measuring a number of other outcomes, including how quickly patients improve, new score, how much oxygen they use, duration of admission, and obviously the safety of the intervention. So this has been a really fantastic study, um, and I'm very grateful to all of the uh, the, the participants, their families, uh, but also the fantastic team in the lab in TCTU uh, and in, um, in the CRC that have delivered this study in record time. We've recruited 300 patients to this study in barely three months. So I can't show you results of Stop COVID yet, uh, which is a shame, but I hope Tom will invite me back uh, in the new year to tell you uh, to unveil the results of that trial, which I really hope will give us a different way of treating patients with COVID-19. I've spoken all day about respiratory disease, and I'm conscious that not everybody who comes to Grand Rounds is a respiratory physician. So I'm gonna finish by telling you why wherever you work, you should care about this drug, you should care about this mechanism. Uh, and I'm gonna show you some, some uh, experimental data. So this is now an inflammatory bowel disease. Remember I told you that the proteins that you see in inflammatory bowel disease, that proteome that, uh, from Holly's brilliant study, uh, if you look at inflammatory bowel disease, you see exactly the same proteins because that's a net driven disease as well. It's a neutrophil driven disease. So here's an experimental model 
where mice have been given uh, a chemical to induce a model of inflammatory bowel disease. And what you see, this is damage to the, uh, to the bowel lumen by endoscopy. And the damage is high if you don't get any treatment. If you give this drug, which is the DPP-1 inhibitor, you dramatically reduce the amount of endoscopic damage. Likewise, um, I'm glad I don't have to actively do these experiments. Somebody is evaluating the consistency of mouse droppings. Uh, and the consistency of mouse droppings is dramatically improved by the administration of this drug. Doesn't mean it's going to work in humans, but highly, highly suggestive that this mechanism is important in inflammatory bowel disease, just as it is uh, in human disease, in, in human respiratory disease. Uh, and this is a, a positive control. And you can see that the drug is giving results that's very similar to the positive control, which is the best available therapy for the, for the disease. Okay, so gastroenterologists should care about what we're doing. I also love my local renal physicians, and so I don't want them to feel left out. And this is now an experimental model of lupus nephritis. And again, here, the control, you get significant damage to the kidney with the control, as measured by renal function or albumin creatinine ratio. And administration of the drug prevents renal damage in a model of lupus nephritis to a similar extent to the positive control. I could show you further data from models of rheumatoid arthritis. I could show you further data from other experimental models. Um, all of this is data that's in the public domain. Very encouraging that all of these diseases that are driven by neutrophilic inflammation may be targetable by this or similar drugs that are going to target this mechanism uh, through DPP-1 neutrophil elastase. So going back to my man and the, uh, the process of neutrophilic inflammation, it's critical to multiple diseases. We have not historically had drugs that can target neutrophilic inflammation. We are potentially on the cusp of having this and multiple other drugs that can target these mechanisms uh, that could then lead to breakthroughs in several diseases. I genuinely believe that, that this is a, a significant breakthrough for bronchiectasis, and I hope we get to test it in other respiratory diseases uh, in due course. So thank you again for the invitation to present. Um, the key messages to take away are, I love neutrophils, and now you should go away loving neutrophils as well. Neutrophil extracellular traps are really important uh, in multiple diseases. They are a, a damaging host response um, that we can finally target through this mechanism, DPP-1 inhibition. And we've demonstrated for the first time that that has clinical benefits. And we're now doing a much larger study. Uh, and I really hope it's going to help in COVID-19 as well. Uh, and thanks to the amazing work of many teams within the university and outside the university, we're going to know within the next couple of months. I have to finish by thanking uh, the amazing people that I work with every day. Uh, I think I am possibly the luckiest man on earth to get to, to do really exciting science with really amazing people. Uh, and I can't fit the photos of everybody who has contributed to this work on the, the slide, but I hope they all know how much I appreciate them, uh, particularly our collaborators, Jeffrey, uh, Colin, TCTU, CRC, and all of the team in the lab uh, who've, who've done this work, delivered these studies, and uh, uh, continue to, to try and find new treatments for people with lung disease. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, James. And that, that uh, was really what, a, what an amazing presentation. Thanks so much. And uh, you talked us, walked us through the, the pathway, uh, your journey of loving the neutrophil to, to, uh, to how that plays out for, in, in, in COVID, et cetera. Um, and it's, uh, you know, I can say, because I've witnessed it closely for, for over a decade, the, the amount of work and effort you've put into this to get to where you are now is phenomenal. And I think you'd, we're just really reaping the rewards of, of, of all that work and effort. And of course, all the research fellows, all those PhD students, and, um, and hopefully the collaboration with the respiratory unit that we've, we've had a bit of a hand to play in that. Um, so we're all very proud. So thank you very much. Um, now, are there any questions from the floor? I have a question. I'll just 
throw at you. So in bronchiectasis, uh, you showed nicely in, a, in the, in the um, meta-analysis from a couple of years ago that, um, that uh, nebulized antibiotics reduce um, exacerbation rates, but they don't do an awful lot to quality of life. Um, you, you mentioned in a throwaway slide there that, that you improve symptoms. Did you collect data on quality of life and uh, so in, with, with resocative? Can you just maybe talk about that a bit? Yeah, so absolutely. So we, we measured, we used a questionnaire, which is called the quality of life bronchiexis questionnaire, which has multiple domains. Um, it's a relatively small study, so we weren't terribly well powered to detect differences in symptoms, but we did find statistically significant improvements in two of the seven domains. Um, so we didn't find improvements in cough and sputum as much as we expected. It may be we just weren't powered to, to show that, but we did find improvements in other domains. Um, so it looks as if it's improving symptoms, but we will know that in, in far greater detail once we've studied 1,600 patients rather than 200 patients. Excellent. That's, that's really good. That's, um, I think that's one of the problems we're facing clinically in bronchiexis clinic is that um, it's not just an exacerbation disease. It's an everyday symptom disease that people, it's fairly miserable day to day. So hopefully this dropping inflammation and it, that, that log scale is very impressive, how dramatically you can drop inflammation that, that over time we might see a drop in symptom scores. Yeah, so I, I, would, I would just comment on that. I mean, I think the most of the symptoms that we get in severe patients is actually the thickness and difficulty expectorating the sputum. And the DNA, the sticky DNA from these nets is a big part of that. And so I suspect that once we treat for longer and in larger numbers of people, we'll start to see patients reporting less of those types of symptoms. One of the um, one of the issues, of course, in bronchi in what um, is still called non-CF bronchiectasis, is that the CF treatments don't necessarily transfer across. And DNA A's, which specifically gets rid of DNA, works very well in CF, but has been shown in a big trial to not work in bronchiectasis. So why does that not work with this? Does um, really good question. the The easiest answer to give is we don't really know. Um, one hypothesis, and there's a few papers to back this up, is that you have to be a little bit careful with DNAs because um, uh, in some circumstances, if you add DNAs to complexes of DNA plus this enzyme that's damaging called elastase, the DNA is acting as a kind of buffer to the enzyme. And if you take away the DNA, you actually get more active enzyme. So in certain circumstances, it looks like you can actually exacerbate inflammation by taking away the DNA. Um, so in, in patients that are not quite so severe, where the DNA is blocking some of that enzyme, that might explain why we got increased exacerbations with DNAs in bronchiectasis. But it sounds like a good idea to not, not to make the stuff in the first place. That, I mean, that, that kind of is the, the theme of this year, isn't it? Prevention is better than cure. Uh, let's, let's stop outbreaks of COVID rather than try and treat them. Yeah. Let's, give, let's give vaccines rather than giving treatments. And in this case... You know, if you want to block an inflammatory pathway, block it where the cell's born rather than trying to resolve a, a fully inflamed, damaged lung, which is a very difficult thing to do. Because uh, I've, I've tried multiple other mechanisms to try and block this net pathway, and they haven't worked, I think, because we've been too downstream. Going, going upstream to the bone marrow seems to have hit the sweet spot. And I can't believe you didn't think of papillon Lefebvre syndrome sooner. I mean, really. Yeah, well, you know, we have so many of those patients to look after, Tom, that, that you know, I was too busy. <laughs> Excellent. Right. OK, so um, you love the neutrophil. I still love the eosinophil. So we'll maybe have a sell off at some point later in a, <laughs> in a grand round down in, in 2021. Um, I will, of course, invite you back uh, to come and talk about the Stop COVID trial. I think we, we, we're all desperate to know if Brent Socrative did make a difference. Um, um, and so please do come back in the new year. I'll, I'll be pestering you for that. Unless anybody else has any questions in the chat. Doesn't look like it. So we'll sign off for now. Um, this I'll have a slightly challenging task of trying to get rid of the buzzing noise from the YouTube video, but I'll sort that out. This will all go on the YouTube channel, um, along with all the other grand rounds from this year, all the way back to 2015, if you're bored over the Christmas holidays. 
do have a very good Christmas. Um, Grand Rounds returns in January. There are still empty slots. So if you are sat there thinking I could give a better talk than that Sharma's lad, then um, please let me know and we will, uh, and I'll give you a slot. Well, they're starting to fill up, uh, but please let me know because I can give you a, give you a slot. Um, have a good Christmas. Hope everything is well. Stay safe and um, take care. Thanks again, James. Thanks. Happy Christmas.